Hey, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our recap on Q4 fund flows. My name is Kyle Gears, and I am a customer success manager here at YChart, joined by my colleague, Nicole Simos, and we manage the relationships for our clients in the asset management vertical. So we're working with distribution teams to help them engage with their clients, communicate their value props and their strategies, which leads to better outcomes for their clients. Today, we're gonna to walk through some of the themes from 2023 and especially what happened in Q4 as we ended the year. Questions during today's presentation can be sent using the Q&A chat feature in Zoom. Please feel free to submit your questions and we'll most definitely get back to them. And we'll also have a recording of the presentation that will be sent to all the folks that registered. And we will have a recording posted to YouTube as well, if that's a little bit easier to access. Please keep in mind that the content of the webinar is meant for educational purposes only. It's not intended to be used as investment advice, nor is YChart acting as an advising party regarding client funds in any way. So once again, recording will be emailed to everybody as well as available on our YouTube channel. Now, before we jump into things, would love to set the scene a little bit. And I think there's a three key themes from 2023. One, which we can't stop hearing about is the MAG7 and their leadership in the market cap weighted indices. Next is the anticipation of rate cuts. You know, what's the Fed's next move? When are they going to happen? When is the time to move from cash into products with duration? And then number three, cash on the sidelines. You know, we saw cash pile up in the form of money markets or CDs, or other cash equivalents. What's the impact of that? How much cash is really on the sidelines? And when is that going to be redeployed? What are the effects going to be of that cash being redeployed? I want to start out with an overview of the major asset classes or categories. And I mean, you could see the, the glaring difference here between money markets and every other asset class. I mean, once again, you just see cash flowing to the sidelines. One thing I do want to point out, though, is you know, how much cash really is on the sidelines. I think people think of just that, that raw number. But rather than take, taking a step back and thinking, well, hey, as a you know, percentage of something like M2 money supply or other variables, how much cash are we really talking about? So I wanted to share just a quick chart that I built within Y chart. And we're looking at three things. The purple line here is the total amount of assets in money market funds. And it's a couple months delayed, but as you can see, we're reaching peaks, we're reaching all time highs there, looking back since 2000. The second line, this blue line here, is the percentage of assets in money market funds as a part of the S&P's market cap. So if we're looking at that right now, 17% of the S&P's market cap is in cash versus if you look back during the great financial crisis, that number is a little closer to 50%. Then this green line down here is basically taking the total assets and money market funds as a percentage of M2 money supplier ratio. So about 30% or so based on the, the last updated number of money markets as part of the M2 money supply. And once again, you can look back to great financial crisis or even the tech bubble, which those levels were a little bit higher versus where they are now. So once again, Money markets dominated the flows, but it's encouraging to see things like equity and fixed income starting to see some of those assets trickle back in. All right, and I will jump in here, Kyle. On this slide, we'll be looking at fixed income flows for mutual funds and ETFs. So we can take a look at the Q4 2023 flows here on the left, and then the 2023 aggregate flows on the right. Taking a look at you know, where, where these flows were going, um, intermediate core bond led the charge for inflows in both Q4 as well as the entire year, bringing in around $124.7 billion in inflows. 
We can see here, looking at the uh, brown uh, column on the far right-hand side of both graphics, short-term bond took a dive in Q4, losing $18.94 billion in assets, which is a trend that held true for the entire year. Again, looking at that right-hand image, we can see that short-term bond had outflows of around $62.55 billion. Other notable trends uh, in terms of inflows in both Q4 and 2023 included long government, seeing inflows of $53.28 billion over the year, as well as intermediate government with $29.28 billion of inflows again throughout 2023. And finally, ultra short bond uh, saw $12.7 billion of inflows in 2023. And an overall theme uh, throughout the year, right, was those bond yields continued to, to rise. So medium term U.S. Treasury yields were rising a little bit earlier in June. Shorter term Treasury bills or long term bonds either declined or ended um, you know, that specific month relatively unchanged. And the general theme, of course, was putting money into money market funds, right? So as investors leaned into longer term bonds, they pulled money out of short term bonds, funds and bank loan funds. And this did indicate, you know, investors could be wondering why they would take risk uh, to the downside when they could move assets into money markets. So as Kyle mentioned, you know, that was a constant theme throughout 2023. And it'll be really interesting to see where uh, those assets go in 2024. Yeah, I think if investors are thinking, hey, I want to add duration and they're sitting in cash, I think it's a matter of, well, I'm either going to step out a little further on the curve in the intermediate space as shown by the flows, or if they're looking at the shorter end of the curve, it's usually taken on risk in the form of high yield. So that's where we've seen a lot of flow go. It's either, hey, I'm going to sit on the sidelines and not take on any take on any risk and you know collect my five plus percent or hop into the you know middle of the curve or short end from the, the high yield standpoint of things. Next we're going to cover combined mutual fund and ETF flows on the equity side. And you know once again here is just a, a glaring difference between all other styles and large blend is just absolutely dominating in part by a lot of the passive s p tracking etfs and as i mentioned earlier i mean the mag 7 was all the talk over the last few months and it's the theme of 2023 in general just how good the performance was it makes folks forget about 2022 pretty easily and as far as a, a visual here, this one has been a favorite just to understand what the impact was of the MAG-7. So this is something that we constructed, um, the, our marketing team constructed, I would say, that shows you, hey, based on market cap weightings, here is the performance in 2023. So you have just the MAG-7 in green, you have the S&P as a whole in orange, and then the other 493, as we're calling them, in red. So just to understand the impact of the MAG-7 and how well the, the S&P actually performed, this is a great visual to understand that. But now that conversation probably shifts to a matter of, well, hey, you know, we saw all these inflows, the performance is that good. Now is it time to take some of the, the chips off the table? And you can see, I mean, small caps and mid caps just haven't really gotten much love lately. There hasn't been a lot of flow there, much consideration just because large caps have been so dominant, especially in the, uh, you know, in the blend space or for the, the S and P tracking products. But we have some pieces out there and I encourage everybody to check out our Y charts asset management pulse, which is a newsletter on LinkedIn. We actually just recapped the opportunity in small caps relative to large caps, especially given where, their prices at versus large cap. So make sure you check that out on LinkedIn and subscribe. There's some really good content there. Okay, on this slide, we will be taking a look at the equity style flows for mutual funds and ETFs in Q4 on the left, and then conversely for the entire year of 2023 on the right. 
So looking first at Q4, we can see mutual funds saw a great outflow across large value, large blend, and large growth, which led the charge with $826.74 billion in outflows. Conversely, uh, ETF saw the greatest inflows into large blend with $109.23 billion in inflows. Based on 2023's flow trend, it seems that if any assets return into equities, ETFs seem really well positioned to assume those flows. Last year, ETFs saw net positive flows in eight of the nine equity style boxes, while mutual funds saw net negative flows across all style boxes. So the general theme here is that we've got so much money right flowing into index ETFs and mutual funds are continuing or did continue to see outflows while ETFs were green almost all across the board. And then finally, just an interesting point here, large growth was the leader in 2023 um, and we did not see much flow into large growth, which is uh, an interesting side note there. Yeah, it's always always funny how the category with some of the largest outflows winds up performing the best. And just to take a look at something like the right hand side of the page here, this graphic, and mutual funds just seeing outflows across the board where ETFs are seeing inflows. So good time to be selling ETFs. We think about it all the time. You know, there's no firm answer, but hey, is it due to liquidity? Is it due to tax efficiency? You know, who knows? Maybe there's more model portfolio business going on leading to assets into ETFs, but you know, we're starting to, to see that trend continue uh, in the ETF world versus mutual funds. And one, one last quick note on that, crushed the numbers a couple of months ago and ETFs as far as total assets are still only a third of the assets that mutual funds have. Next, we'll talk a little bit about sectors and you know, really no surprise here. It seems investors were following the hot trends in 23. Technology saw the most flow from a, a sector specific product standpoint, followed by communications. Uh, then you have healthcare at the end, a lot of outflow, a lot of healthcare. For example, one that took a, a huge hit Pfizer, you know, you, you think of that and just not as much opportunity as they had over the past few years. Demand slowed down, earnings took a hit and so on. So you see healthcare falling out of favor there in, in Q4. Uh, overall, 2023, once again, tech, communication, consumer, cyclical, you know, a, a lot of those leaders that have been leaders for the past you know, multiple years, I would say, came back into favor. Uh, energy was the, the big loser after oil prices topped out, inflation started slowing down a little bit. A lot of assets started coming out of energy in addition to healthcare. I know previously we were discussing the massive inflow into ETFs. And I guess a natural question at that point would be, what's been driving that inflow. So taking a look at this, this graphic here, we are showcasing um, passive, active, and smart beta ETF flows in Q4 2023. So in 2023, another um, revealing trend emerged that we were able to see as active ETFs really punched above their weight class when attracting assets. Despite making up less than 5% uh, of the total ETF AUM, active ETFs accounted for 21.6% of inflows in 2023. So we also saw here too, taking a look at the um, the first line here, passive ETF flows made up 4.65% of flows in 2023 and smart beta ETFs made up only 2.44% of flows as a percentage of AUM. So really interesting to see, um, see this breakdown here and, and just really understand a little bit more deeply uh, what was really driving that inflow into ETFs on a more granular level. Yeah, and I, I'd say it's an encouraging sign for active ETFs. I mean, a lot of managers are converting 
mutual funds or launching new active ETFs and the interest is there. And I think investors are seeing the value. I mean, that 24% number you know, representing the flow based on total AUM, I think there's only upside from there. And, just, you know, you got to think of it from the standpoint of, well, hey, the passive ETF grouping, I mean, that's a massive amount of assets, as you can see here. So there's definitely a lot of growth in the uh, the active ETF space as we continue to see new active ETFs launched. Here we're looking at mutual fund and ETF combined net flows. And once again, I mean, we kind of saw this earlier in the presentation, but large blend just absolutely dominating. Uh, as you can imagine, the usual suspects, SPY, ZOO, IVV, but then you have something like RSP, which takes a little bit different approach, that equal weighted S&P. And as you're starting to see the S&P continue to rise, hit new all-time highs, you see that market cap weighting. Well, you know, at some point, the contrarian in you has to say, well, hey, let's take a step back and maybe we take some some chips off the table. And once again, it goes back to that graphic that I brought up earlier on the MAG7 versus the S&P and the other 493. I mean, is that tide going to turn anytime soon? And you also see just across the board, mid cap, small cap. And you know, we do a good job of conditional formatting here to draw your eyes to those categories or those style boxes that are bringing in assets. And you know, you're not really seeing a, a whole heck of a lot of assets flowing into mids and smalls. But once again, you know, when is their time going to be? In this slide, we'll be taking a look at the greatest inflows in mutual funds for 2023. So unquestionably, the uh, asset class that benefited the most from the Fed's rate hikes over the past couple of years was money market funds, as, as we've touched upon previously. In 2023, um, interestingly, these funds attracted over $970 billion in assets. And while money market funds have been the focus um, this past year, it's really great to see flows going back into you know, core bonds, as we can see here at the very top of this graphic. We can also see the big three categories here as well, taking a look at the most outflow section of this graphic. So specifically looking at large growth, large value, and large blend which all saw really substantial outflows. And there could be a number of reasons uh, for this, right? Um, but potentially investors are becoming more educated on ETFs as we've seen you know, a lot of attraction in that space. And perhaps you know, we're also seeing a larger focus or interest in liquidity. Looking ahead this year in 2024, asset managers will definitely need to convince investors and advisors that their strategies are the best choice for any assets coming off the sideline. Yeah, you see that that glaring number on money markets, but once again, encouraging to see something like core bond as that next category in Q4. And you know, I think I think it's notable that we've reached a a turning point in a sense, and rates potentially may have peaked. I think that's where a lot of folks are focused and where their head's at right now is, hey, when is the right time to deploy some of that cash? And a lot of my clients have seen this chart. I've shared it on LinkedIn, but something simple like this, it's extremely effective. It's looking at the rate peak in, no, sorry, October 19th, 2023. So we have the 10 year here in this blue line peaking around 500 basis points in October. But then you have, and in this example, I have the ag versus a Schwab money market as a cash proxy and just showing what the upside looks like or has looked like thus far when it comes to owning duration and, you know, Hey, how much more upside is there? Do we, do we think, or do clients think, that the Fed's going to cut in the future? Do they think rates are going to go back up? I mean, this is a great conversation piece or communication piece 
to leverage when you are having those interactions or conversations. Here we're focused strictly on ETFs, and you know, I, I hate to, to mention it once again, but Large Blend is that leader for the flows, and it basically trounces everything else. Starting to see a little bit more back into large growth, which had fallen out of favor most of 2023, but Q4 started to see assets starting to come back in. Core bond, foreign large blend something people are close or keeping an eye on as far as opportunity. You have that U.S. bias that's been present for a while now. Looking at the U.S. dollar, okay, well, do we think the dollar is going to go higher? Do we think it's going to fall? You know, when do you start looking at international opportunities and taking, as I mentioned earlier, some of those chips off the table for domestic equity? And then small blend, small blend, I think is a, a great story because it really hasn't been talked about much. And if you look at, you know, it's price relative to large caps, historically, it's looking as attractive as it's ever been. So I think investors are starting to take note of that, which is why we're seeing some flows into small blend. As far as the outflows go, I mean, inflation protected bond makes sense. Everybody's heading toward the exits there. Short term, I think you're you know, either taking no risk or stepping out on, on the curve a little bit further in the intermediate space, or if you are, you know, keeping it short-term, going short-term high yield. Uh, trading leveraged equity always shows up. A lot, of, you know, a lot of hedge fund activity there or trading activity, obviously. Healthcare we talked about, and then consumer defensive sort of rounding out that list. So the data that we covered today, all of it, is within Y charts. Kudos to our marketing team for doing a phenomenal job in capturing the data, putting it together, creating great visuals that you can actually share with your clients. So the question is, well, where can I get this? Where can I find this? If you're in the Y charts website, all you need to do is go to the support drop down. And then if you go to insights and visuals, You'll normally see, I think just because of my screen size, I'm not able to see it. There we go. If you go to support, you'll see our fund flows report direct link. You can click into that and access our current fund flows reports, which have all that high level data conditionally formatted. However, what we covered today is included in our US summary visuals deck. This is a great way to engage with clients, create presentations around the visuals deck, pull it up in meeting, just to understand where those flows are moving, provide insights to clients, back up your story. In addition to the fund flows information, we also have some other areas such as original research. I would recommend the supercharged asset gathering top 10 visuals for client and prospect meetings. This has a lot of great stuff, such as the MAG7 focus, or hey, what happens if you miss out on some of the best days in the market throughout the year or throughout previous calendar years? How does that impact your return? So a lot of really great stuff that you can use high level, not product specific, but it's gonna just help with the visual standpoint and help get the points that you're trying to make across to clients. That wraps up our Q4 Fun Flows webinar. I hope everybody gained some additional insight or have a few takeaways that they can leverage and weave into their conversations. Uh, if you have left any questions in the chat, we'll make sure that we tackle those or get back to you on those. And if you have any follow-up questions and you are a YCharts user, feel free to reach out to your support rep directly, whether that's on any of the charts or data we covered today. But appreciate you for joining us today and looking forward to the next fun flow review.